Hey garden friends, I bet you guys are so ready for a vegetable garden tour. So grab a drink and come stroll along with me as we go through my happy place, the vegetable garden. We're gonna check out all the cool stuff I have growing in the raised beds, as well as head over to my green stocks and see what they have. And then we're gonna check out the mini fruit orchard that I planted along with all those berry bushes. So come join me, let's check it out. So these first couple beds right here are looking a little sparse, but this one is filling in really nicely. And this is actually where I'm housing all my watermelons, but I wanna show you one that I'm super proud of. Let's head over here. I got my first watermelon. I'm honestly, I can't remember exactly which uh, variety this one is, but it got pollinated all on its own. I have been hand pollinating a lot of my cucumbers and my squashes and my watermelons, but this guy got pollinated by the bees. So I think it's safe to say I don't have to hand pollinate anymore. Now I have struggled with being able to grow watermelons for a long time. At first I couldn't keep the plants alive. And then once I was able to keep the plants alive, I couldn't get them to pollinate the flowers. And then once I learned how to hand pollinate, um, I would get very tiny watermelons and then the plant would die off from powdery mildew. And then last year I was able to grow them to complete size, but I did not pick them at the appropriate time and they were not fully ripe on the inside. So this year is the year. I got about, I think it's either six or seven different varieties that I'm trying out because when I go through that much trouble and I still can't get something to grow and I know that it can grow down here because other growers have done it, I go towards maybe I have the wrong variety. So that's why I'm growing six or seven <laughs> different varieties. I have a crimson sweet, a tender sweet orange. I skipped the sugar babies because those are the ones that I've tried for years. And so I'm thinking they're not gonna work. I don't think they're gonna work. I went with Chow, Cho Chow. I'll put all the names of these down into the description. And then I got the moon and stars, which I gotta show you this one, guys. This one looks so cool. At first I thought it was like a problem with the leaves, but now I'm realizing this is just the pattern. Oh, we have a luber friend here. Let me show you him. Do you guys see him? Little, little jerk. We'll take care of him later. <laughs> but um, if you look at these leaves, they have these, these speckled patterns on them which from what I understand, the actual uh, watermelon also has these speckled patterns. It has, it's called um, a moon and stars because it'll have a yellow spot, which looks like the moon on the watermelon, which is where it lays on, I got a bee friend, uh, <laughs> where it lays on the ground. And then it has the star pattern all over. Instead of those stripes that you're used to seeing on a watermelon, it has these stars. So. Man, I really hope I get one in here. So cross our fingers, we are hoping for a good watermelon harvest this year because it is one of our favorite fruits to eat and I have yet to win this one. Guys, I just, I just noticed another one. Hold on, I gotta show it to you, it's so cute. Hold on here. He just kind of popped up out of nowhere. You see him? Okay, I'm pretty sure this is the orange tender sweet. So I'm gonna get him protected. I'm gonna put a tray underneath him and uh, that way he's not touching the ground so that the bugs can't get to him because I found that that is something that I have to be careful of. Now, when I had planted these watermelons, I had also planted some beans and I had planted the beans first, expecting that these beans would be completely dry and dead by the time that the watermelons had grown out. But as you can see here, I'm kind of fighting to get these beans out of the watermelon vines. And uh, even though they're not 100% dry, they're close enough that I feel comfortable going ahead and pulling them out just to give those watermelons a little bit more room to grow. So now by doing that, you can see that we have left 
a lot more space for these watermelons to kind of grow out and not be, you know, hindered by those beans. Most of the beans were pretty much ready to go. Some of them had entered into that dry stage. So I have some that I can save and I have some that we can eat, which I'm excited about. And then we found an actual onion that's doing well. So I'm super stoked about that. We have our one watermelon that we knew about. We have another one right there that's pretty big size. There's, I see at least two that are like that size, which means that I'm not 100% they've been pollinated, but they look much bigger than they did the day before. So that's usually a pretty good sign they got pollinated. Now we're gonna go to one of my favorite beds and also one of my messiest beds, which has all kinds of stuff in it. So this bed over here has squash, corn, and cucumbers. So let me show you the squash I have first. So this is my, I believe, let me find the tag. Okay, this is the Walther butternut squash, and this did great for me last summer, believe it or not. I was pretty shocked. I mean, the pickle worms really get after it, but as you can see, it's growing beautifully. I have my first one here. I have lots of flowers coming in and it is just naturally growing up the trellis, which is awesome. This one did spectacular last year. I think I've got the most productivity of any squash, a butternut squash that I've ever grown was just using the Waltham, which is like an heirloom variety. I've tried hybrids, I've tried all kinds of stuff and I can get them to grow, um, but the one with the most productivity has been this one. And so I wanted to regrow it again, see if I could replicate that. And so far it's doing really good. It's holding out to the blight really well. Now over here, let me bring you around. Over here, I have a new uh, scallop squash that I'm really excited about. I've grown lots of different scallop squashes. Some, not so well, like the early bush white I didn't like. This one is like a yellow hybrid. And so it's coming in nicely. It's very short, but you can see that I have a lot of female flowers coming in, but I haven't had a male flower in a while. So if you have that happen to you, what I do is I'll take my butternut squash, which is right next to it, and I will cross pollinate it. And that means that I'm not going to be able to save the seeds, but I can get some squash. Once I get one that I know for certain was pollinated by the correct flower, I will mark that squash in some way so that, that way I know I can save that one. Now behind me, Besides those, oh, there's also another one here. Uh, which one is this one? Here we go. Oh, it's just a yellow scallop squash. Here, let me show it to you. You can almost barely see it because it is so tiny. Um, this one did not grow quite as fast and it kind of doesn't look all that great, but I think it was because we had the giant broccoli that never wanted to die and I could have kept it going, but I knew these guys needed more sun, so I pulled it out. I'm hoping it's gonna catch up with its other friends over here before it gets super, super hot because they don't generally set fruit very well in super hot conditions. Now, the yellow straight neck squash will um, if you can hold off the pickle worms, but the scallop squashes did not set fruit for me once the temperatures got above 90. And then, my pride and joy, which I don't know how we're gonna do this year, is my corn. And so I succession planted my corn. I have, oh, look at that, man. In just a couple days, in just a couple days, I have some silks here. I have some silks here. There's some silks there. I can see some silks in the back. So those are all the silks that I need to hand pollinate. So let me get to that really quick. You guys join me, we're gonna hand pollinate some corn. Now corn is typically pollinated by wind, but I always like to give it a little helping hand and I just take one, leaving plenty on the plants, but I take one of my little um, tassels, clip it off, and I just kind of run it all along the silk. So I'm gonna do that for a couple of them.
So now we got those guys hand pollinated. And I wanted to show you one that's really cool because I got two on the same plant, which has never happened to me. I only usually get one on each plant. If you can see there, I've got the top one right here and I have a little guy coming in right there. And these silks are just newly developed. This guy down here is a little short. I'm a little surprised to see him so low. I'm suspecting that I'm gonna see another one maybe pop up up here. And if you're wondering why some of them are kind of tall, like right here, and then some of them are really short over here, that's because um, I planted them at different times. I had some seriously hard times with pollinating corn this year. I suspect my corn was old. Um, so my first round of corn did not have good germination rates. My second round of corn had better germination rates, but they started almost three weeks after. So they're a bit behind. And so I'm just gonna get corn at different times, which is okay with me. And then our last guy in this bed that I wanted to show you is the cucumbers. I still have, still have some random peas that are growing here. I'm just gonna let them go ahead and save for seed. But I have a few cucumbers that I need to get because they have kind of gotten away from me, which happens a lot in my house. This is a Boston pickling cucumber. Uh, it's supposed to be more like, there's a good sized one. I guess it's supposed to be more like this size right here, but I went away for the weekend. <laughs> so we're just gonna take him off. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take the ones off that uh, are small, cause I need to make some pickles. So we're gonna get this guy. I like to take them off when the skin is still spiky because the pickle worms don't tend to like to crawl on the skin when it's spiky but when it's big like this one the spikes have pretty much come off and it doesn't really deter the pickle worms so i like to get those off as soon as possible let's see if we got any more that i can take there's one He's probably like the perfect size for a cucumber. That one's too small. That one's too small. Okay. The other thing I like to do when I'm out here is I want to hand pollinate them. Uh, I have seen plenty of bees, so I'm not really concerned that they're getting pollinated, but whenever I can give the plant a hand at being super productive, you know, that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> Now this next bed, this was where our garlic and onions were. So um, I'm pretty much leaving it alone. This bed is going to be dedicated to my white uh, sweet potatoes, which I'm still waiting on. Although I did put, <laughs> I have some volunteer tomatoes. I'm gonna let them go until I put the sweet potatoes in and see what happens. I love volunteers. And then over here, right there, tiny, tiny little guys that are getting chewed up a little bit, but there's a few um, through the back here too. I'm trying my hand at okra. I have heard that okra is awesome when you eat it fresh. I've only had it from the store and it's gross to me. <laughs> so I'm giving it a shot because I have found that some vegetables are just amazing when you grow them and are completely different than when you buy them in the grocery store. The only other thing I have going on in this bed is I'm saving some seeds. This was my chaijimisai. I've got two of them. That one did not seed super great, but this one has seeded super great. You can see that there's like these pods and they're doing very well. And then behind me, this huge mound, that is the parsley that we harvested and made chimichurri sauce from, and it has completely grown back and I would cut it down, but I saw a swallowtail land some babies over there. And then I saw some baby swallowtails. So I'm not ready to take it down yet until I can see them have fluttered off. So we're gonna wait on them. My next bed, so excited about. So the next bed I have going on is my 
tomato forest is what I'm calling it. But you can see I have some tomatoes right back here. These are my larger size tomatoes. These are Neptune, which is one of my favorite vine ripe type size of tomatoes that is also determinate. So it's putting on quite a bit of fruit right now, which is cool. They're all gonna come all at once, which is fine with me because I'm gonna make sauce. And in between them, I have some indeterminates, I have some cherries, I have some current tomatoes like an Everglade. I also have a Bellevue and a red current tomato. There are a ton of different tomatoes in here. And um, I don't know if you can notice, but the Florida weave is working. There are some adjustments that I would make to it. <laughs> uh, this pole right here is starting to lean. It's still holding right now. I'm just getting a little bit concerned that as they get much higher that they, it's not gonna be able to hold it up. So I would definitely move forward with the bamboo posts in the future or T posts in the future. Um, but in a pinch, I'm telling you those little green cheap poles are working just fine or even a board a stake something like that the trick is get them pushed very far down into the soil doing the twine has not really been a big deal i do it like once every two weeks i'll add some twine now the lesson i learned here is i probably should not have put the little tiny tomatoes in the center because they're very hard to twine as i'm trying to reach up and over the bigger tomatoes i should have done this in uh you know height order so the little one should have been up front the bigger one should have been in the back so that they're easier to reach so some learning lessons but all in all i think this is going to end up being my favorite way to trellis tomatoes but we will see so make sure to hit that bell notification so that you don't miss future episodes on whether this trellising system actually worked the next bed we're going to take a look at is not fully planted yet um, but that is this bed right here and um, I have some zinnias. I had some that died out It's been tough to water lately, but I'm gonna add some more here to take its place, but I have Tomatillos I'm gonna show you those up close, but I have tomatillos and they are growing very easily I have grown the pineapple tomatillos before the little tiny um, tomatillos that taste like pineapple, like a tropical fruit, but these are the green tomatillos that I want to make salsa verde with. Um, so I have those. I have some random tomatoes that I didn't know what to do with them. So I stuck them in here in tomato cages. Then over here, you guys might remember that I have started putting in my sweet potatoes and they are doing well. They have taken, they have rooted. I have the rest of this bed that I'm going to plant the rest of them in. And eventually they're going to become this huge mat and uh, these tomatillos are gonna have to grow above them because I overplant every single season. <laughs> Let's take a look at the next one. This next bed I'm really excited about. So far, I have only lost one, and that is my peppers, particularly my sweet peppers. Um, couldn't even tell you all the varieties. I, have, I do have them labeled, so I'm trying to do a better job, but I have peppers everywhere and i have um you can see lots of flowers are blooming on all of the plants oh wow they have really taken off i guess i wasn't fully paying attention but i have all kinds of peppers i have pimento uh, paprika red cherries which are a sweet version or sweeter version i have chocolate les lesla uh california wonder yolo and a couple other, I think I have a yellow monster. I have all kinds of sweet peppers. I really wanted to go big with sweet peppers because I ran out a couple of months ago and I really don't want to run out again because we love sweet peppers. Not so much a fan of hot peppers. We did grow them last summer and they did very well and we have still a lot in the freezer because we don't use that much and we dehydrated a bunch of Anaheim chili peppers and that's what we make our taco seasoning with. So. These are doing very well. I'm very excited for them. But over here, I have kind of some empty spots. I do have my green onions right here. Over in the corners, I have, and right through here as well, I have my roselles that I planted. And I have some empty spots. These, these are the celery that grew before that we harvested and I froze them, but uh, they're growing back. 
So they're not growing back well. So I'm gonna have to keep chopping these down until they give up. And then I have some open spots here. If you have some ideas for that open spot, definitely give me a shout down in the comments. I need some inspiration on what to grow in some of these open spots. The next bed has a couple open spots too. And so this bed, I don't even know what I'm gonna call this bed, but it's got all kinds of weird stuff in it. So right here is a, you can barely see it right outside the camera, is a purple sprouting broccoli. I don't think it's gonna do anything. I'm mainly keeping it to use the leaves as greens. I have chamomile right through here. I have some copper straw flowers. This is the um, sweet Elysium that I grew over the winter. And the only reason it is still here is I'm trying to save the seeds so that I can grow a lot more of it. It smells wonderful. Behind it, that's getting chewed up pretty badly is the kohlrabi, but the kohlrabi is actually producing the the kohlrabi root i don't know if you call it a root but it, the the vegetable part um, down at the base of the plant and that's doing really well i have calendula that's coming up that's going to be one of my medicinal plants along with the chamomile i have some marigolds coming in and i'm sure there's a few other things through this one like i said i'm not holding out a lot of hope for this sprouting broccoli but i gotta say it's actually oh wait Check that out. You guys, we are seeing this together. That's its first sprout. I really did not expect that, so that's cool. We have some of the roselles. I'm very excited by this German chamomile. I've been picking those flowers off and drying them. I have a few other plants right here. Here's that straw flower, copper straw flower. Those are the acelliums. Um, here are the kohlrabis, a couple of them, like especially the chewed up one, isn't doing great. But if you take a look down here, you can start to see the bulbs forming on several of these. So we'll be eating those. Those are the last of the brassicas coming in. And then we'll have to bid farewell to them. These are all um, in orange tangerine marigold. And then here is that calendula I was mentioning such a pretty flower, great medicinal. I use it as, I think they call it a hippie neosporin. So I make it into a salve. If you haven't seen that video, I will post it in the description below. But you can see I have a lot of flowers that are just starting to come. And the more you pick them, the more they will flower. So that's it for the beds. Now we're gonna head over to the green stalks and see how things are doing over here. Um, I'll probably show you as part of the green stalks, the pineapple circle and let you know the cool fun thing I'm doing here. And so uh, here's my pineapple circle. And if you haven't noticed it yet, I have squash growing here. <laughs> um, so I have my pineapples. I have some nasturtium, which are like right there. And then I am training this seminal pumpkin to climb up the tree. This is something that I heard was done way back in the day as a way of like preserving space because these guys do take up a lot of space. So I'm going to let it try to climb up this palm tree and see how it does. I know that that means that it's not going to root along the way, which is one of the beneficial reasons why seminal pumpkins can go the distance during summer. But, um, we're gonna hope for the best. The other squash that I have over here is the butter babies. Let me see if I can show you one. Yes, here we go. I have my first butter baby that's growing up. And this, the butter baby is actually doing a lot better growing up than uh, say, you know, the seminal pumpkin. I keep having to train it up. Here are the salmon nasturtions. And they're pushing off a lot of pretty flowers. They're very cute. They're not your typical nasturtium that grows like really crazy. This is a bush variety. So I wanted to keep it short and compact so that it doesn't overwhelm my pineapples. Now let's take a look at the green stalks. So the green stalks have a lot going on right now. So down at the bottom of the green stalks, I have my mint. I always keep the mint at the bottom. And then this right here, I'm super stoked about. This is a lemon bee balm or lemon mint. It's not actually part of the mint family. It's part of the bee balm family. I've been collecting the flowers for a medicinal property. 
And then we have our lemon balm. We have some leftover dill right here. I have a perennial flower. I moved my rosemary into here, but I also put a rosemary in a container just to see how it did in each of those. On this side, we have my never ending parsley, which has just done really well this year. This is more lemon balm creeping out. My sage is finally doing well. My pineapple sage is looking pretty good over here. <laughs> the, the beast oregano, I just trimmed this like four days ago and it's already wild again. My sorrel, this is the time of year where it starts to have a tough time. This dead thing right here is the seeds that I'm saving for the Tokyo Bekinaw. I've got to come out and collect these seeds or they're going to start dropping to the ground and I'm going to lose them all. So I got to get right on that. My perennial Swiss chard never dies. Another luber. Guys, I've killed four during, the, during this video. I'll have to get him next. Uh, this is a red Russian kale. I seeded some Egyptian spinach here, some Shurnama spinach there. And then down below here, I have some Chinese amaranth, which is a short growing version. Some more pineapple, a sage. And then over here, I put in, let's see here, another butter baby. You can tell I'm a, I'm a butter baby fan. So you can see that, I'm not sure if those got pollinated or not. So we shall see. And then up here, I have some bachelor button. And I believe this is a, another type of straw flower. Yeah. Um, these were cuttings that I took a while ago. This is a cranberry hibiscus. And this is a Kiko's crump, which is another type of edible hibiscus. I really like the leaves. If you let them get really big, they get like super big. Now we're going to leave the green stalks and we're going to head over to the fruit and berry way is what we're calling it right now. Uh, peachy. Peachy's doing great. Since we thinned her peaches, her peaches are starting to get bigger. They're starting to get that color. You can see them right. Get you a better shot. You can see them right here. And then another one right there. They're pretty much all over and they're getting fairly big at this point, which is awesome. There's a ton of them all over the tree. I think we're going to get a pretty good harvest. There have been a couple that I've noticed that are pretty high up. I'm not sure if it's bug damage yet or if it's a disease, but they don't look quite right. So, so far it's only been two. So I'm hopeful that that's not going to spread through the whole plant. I haven't been able to get up there and get it because I'd have to bring out a ladder because they're pretty tall. Uh, so let's go through and I'm going to show you the rest of the trees, including the ones that we recently planted. This is my lychee. I really don't expect this one to start producing anytime soon. It's probably a good three years off from uh, producing any fruit, but it is finally starting to grow nice and bushy. This is my sherbet berry, which I believe is an Indian variety. And let me show you some of the berries. They're small right now, but those berries are going to get probably about the size of grapes. And they're amazing and they change different colors. Like, so they're all different colors. And this whole thing was full of blooms. So I am suspecting I'm going to get a lot of berries from this tree. Now, one of our new guys, this is the plum that we put in and I am attempting to graft it. I have a graft right there. I'm not sure how well I did. So once I get the hang of grafting, I will show you. It did come with a couple pieces of fruit. So I have one that's growing right here and there's another one that looks like it's starting to change colors right here. So at least we'll be able to try the fruit this year, even though I'm not expecting much from it. Here is my <laughs> Barbados cherry that you guys have told me time and time again to get it out of here and get it somewhere with more full sun. And I'll be trying that. Um, I'm also working on moving my strawberry plants to live underneath as like an understory for all these trees that are over here. Over here is the elderberry that we planted. And I believe this is what's going to become the flowers of the elderberry. Now elderberries need two 
trees and I only have one. So I'm not holding out a lot of hope, but it will be a good experiment to see if there's anyone around me or if there's any native elderberries around me that might be able to pollinate them. And over here we have my blueberries. I had a really great crop of blueberries last year. This year I did not. The plants were not doing well, mainly because <laughs> I had not been testing the soil. I wasn't paying deep attention to the blueberries and they started to look pretty crappy and I thought that that was just because of summer, but I finally tested their soil and realized that their soil was way too alkaline. They like it a lot more acidic. Put a soil acidifier down and they immediately started to get better. You can see the blackberries here, they're doing very well. I was concerned because they hadn't started blooming in a while, but I'm guessing there's some kind of late variety. Sadly, I don't know the variety. I got it from Home Depot and uh, I lost the tag a while ago, so I'm not exactly sure what kind of variety they are. I do know that they're good for this area. I did check the chill hours of it back when I got it and it has already fruited before and I can already see fruit now. Um, so it just kind of surprised me that it took so long for them to fruit. Then we're going to turn around and we're going to take a look at the loquat here. Loquat's doing amazing. I mean, it has so much growth on the top. It looks outstanding. The leaves look good. It has just taken really well to this spot. Behind it, we have the pomegranate. Um, this one we didn't have at the time that we put the video out, uh, but we ended up being able to procure it also from Green Dreams. They uh, happened to have some come in, so we went and we got a pomegranate. These are not known to be super great for Florida because of the rain, uh, but we're hoping that given that that area of our yard is more protected, there's some trees overhead, that maybe it's not going to get as much of the rain as possible, but we're gonna just monitor it. And then down at the end, we have our mulberries. The mulberries, they're interesting. One's doing extremely well, which is the Thai Dwarf. We put it in, it has been happy ever since. It's actually starting to produce fruit again. Now the world's best is not super happy and they're literally right next to each other. So the soil is the same, the sun is the same, the shade is the same, the watering is the same. So I don't know why one is happy and the other is not. The best guess that I have is that one of them is just having a harder time with transplant shock. That's my best bet. And so I'm just giving it lots of space, lots of time, and hoping that, you know, it bounces back. But as you can see, all of these trees did super well. I know that there was some folks um, on some of my short videos uh, with planting the trees that were concerned about putting so much compost and fertilizer down in the hole or putting so much water down into the hole. And I understand their concerns. I totally get it in other climates, particularly our friends up in the north. I can understand why that might not be a good idea. But down here, this is how I have planted all of my fruit trees and they have all worked out very well. And that includes peachy, that includes cotto up front, the avocado, that includes the lemon tree, it includes the mango and the bananas over at my mom's house. Um, and I've had all of those for years. I think the longest one was the lemon tree. That was the very first tree that I ever bought. And uh, then peachy comes next. I think peachy is four to five years old and the lemon tree is at least five or six years old. So, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, right guys? <laughs> it works. Uh, so we're gonna just keep monitoring it. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying this is the only way that works. Obviously, you know, your microclimate is different. It depends on if you're up high like I am or if you're down below sea level, you know, whether you need to mound it because of the water saturation in your yard, uh, how much wind you get through your yard in that particular area. All of those are common concerns when you're planting a fruit tree. But before we end this video, I want to show you how the banana and the Jabba de Kaba are doing because those are the two that I potted and put on my pool deck. So over here I have the Moringa, the Sweet Almond, and the Vitex. They're doing pretty good. I do have plans to move them into bigger pots or possibly find a place for them, especially the Sweet Almond, but um, I just haven't had time. We've got a lot going on here. I'll have to share some of the newest developments with you guys. But here is my banana tree. and definitely needs to be watered. It's supposed to rain a lot today. So I haven't watered it. That's probably why it's looking a little bit, little bit touch wilty. Um, also, I haven't fed it. So 
I'm gonna grab some compost today. I'm gonna layer it on top and when the rains start coming, hopefully it gets all the rain and then that will feed it. Behind us is the Jabba de Kaba and he is doing spectacular. Um, he has these little like yellowish reddish leaves that are coming in and at first I was a little concerned but as I you know just wait and watch right just see what happens I noticed that those turned nice bright green and now I realize that those light reddish yellowish tiny leaves are actually new growth <laughs> which is awesome it means that it is happy and it's here and it likes growing here so I am stoked about that. It's probably got at least another year before it uh, produces, possibly two. These guys are slow growing and they take a long time to produce. So this is a long game here. This is a marathon, not a sprint with this tree, um, but it is so worth it because I did try them over at Pete's Nursery Green Dreams and it was outstandingly tasty. So I'm willing to wait. So that was the garden tour for today, guys. If you want to watch a couple more of my videos between now and my next upload, I'm going to throw them up here and here. I hope you enjoyed. Happy gardening, guys.